Welcome to Photoshop User TV, brought to you by the National Association of Photoshop Professionals. And now, here are your hosts, the Photoshop Guys. Hi, right, we're back. Oh, wait, no, Corey, I insist. You, you take it, please. Must no. I? Okay. Yes. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Photoshop User TV. We are brought to you by the National Association of Photoshop Professionals, who bring you this magical magazine, <laughs> Photoshop User. This is the newest issue, by the way, so be sure Hot to... Hot off the press. If you are a NAP member, be expecting it. Uh, any, well, you should already have it by now, actually. Yeah. I think it's been out for a little bit. You know, so. Been out a little bit since... We, yep. we, we hope you enjoy it. And be sure to look for the next one coming out soon. We're at 10 issues a year now. I know. One of the many benefits of being a NAP member is, of course, getting that magazine 10 times a year. It alone, to me, is almost worth it. I mean, in addition to the website and everything else you get along with it, but the magazine is certainly one thing I always look forward to every I month. consider the magazine dessert. Yes. It's kind of like that great thing. And it's also a great resource. What yeah. I will do, before I was even working here, I kept them, and I had them on a shelf, and I'd go, Oh man, I want to do this. What was that little tip that so and so did? Oh look, there's my uh, lower third right there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that's what I do is I'd go back and I'd pull out a, a magazine and go, oh yeah, and because mm -hmm. we've got great step-by-step -step tutorials in there that you can go back as references to. I remember one time there was a NAT member. I forgot who it was that they actually take every year's issues, put a three-hole punch in all of them, put them in a binder. And every, wow. And every year, all the issues in, in, in their binder. Man, when you do that, basically you're turning it into a large book of tutorials right. when you do that. So there's a lot of rich information information in there, in the magazine, of course, as well as the website, photoshopuser.com. Check it out. If you are not going to the uh, NAP member website, you need to. We've got full-length classes. We've got mm -hmm. new tutorials just about every day. It's a phenomenal place to go. You've got questions. We've got help desks. The discounts you can get on the NAP website are phenomenal. Please check that out. And don't forget, we've got Photoshop World coming up not too far away. So Absolutely. make sure you reserve uh, your place here in Orlando, April 17th through the 19th. 17th and 19th. Yep. Orlando's a great time. And of course, if you can't make that, remember we'll be in Las Vegas later in the year. We'll have dates for that a little bit later, but yep. it's some September, October time frame there. So be looking for those dates coming up. So, Well, hey, but, let's jump right in. Let's jump. Corey, you've got a tutorial for I us. Do. And I'm feeling like there may be some 3D. Happening. There is. I did not do 3D in the last episode. I'm having some withdrawal, so I have to have my 3D fix in this episode here. And you just kind of saw a hint of it just there on the NAP members website. I just posted this tutorial oh, um, last week. Of course, you know, a couple weeks ago was the Super Bowl. And uh, I'm not really a Ravens fan, but congratulations yeah. to the Baltimore Ravens for winning. And to celebrate, I actually did a tutorial on creating the Lombardi Trophy entirely in 3D here inside Photoshop. So I thought I'd share that with you on the show here, just kind of give you an idea. Now, I'm not going to do the whole tutorial because it's rather lengthy, but I'm just going to kind of show you how I approached um, building uh, specifically the, the part of the football. Now the base is easy enough, it's just an extruded shape and I just kind of modified that. But the ball itself was a bit of a challenge. So what I have here in this document, and let me just make my background white so you can see. What I did was I drew a path here that is the basically half the shape of the football. So what I did was I actually downloaded, went to Google Images and just found a football, you know, an NFL grade football and traced it on that side there. So notice I've got only as minimal control points as I can have here, top and bottom. I had a control point here in the middle that ended up creating a segment in the 3D object. So this is that kind of trial and error you're going to go through. So got my shape sorted out, and notice I only drew it half because we're going to revolve it. Or if you're used to uh, 3D applications, it's called lathing. So I'm going to go back and create a new blank layer and fill it with gray, 50% gray. So I've got my path selected. I'm simply going to go under the 3D menu here and go to new extru 3D extrusion from selected path. Now again, if you're not familiar with Photoshop, these 3D features are only available in the extended version of Photoshop. So if you just have standard, then you will not see that 3D menu. So only standard. Of course, if you're using the Creative Cloud, you get the extended version anyway. So you'll be able to do this. All right. So now I'm just going to take my current view here which is selected here in the 3D panel, and just turn it slightly so I can see it kind of from above here. And there's that extruded element. So in the 3D panel, I'm going to select layer 1, which is my shape. And I'm going to go over here to the Properties panel. Now, I always keep my Properties panel and the 3D panel 
connected to each other because whenever you have selected in the 3D panel, those corresponding settings are in the properties panel. So I'm going to select the layer, layer one here, click on the second tab here at the top of the properties panel, and then we're going to go down to this horizontal angle down here. We've got it set to bend, you'll notice right there. But you have to go up here to where it says deformation axis. And this is, you actually see this in the options bar when you are, defor are transforming an object as well. I want to anchor this to the left side, that flat side of that shape that I built. Now go down here to this horizontal angle and just drag it to the left and notice how the ball wraps around and completes the shape of the ball. Now, what we notice here is that there's this hole going through it. Now, I'm not a football expert, but I don't think there's a hole going through the football, especially in the Lombardi Trophy itself. So how to fix that is to go into the settings once again and take that extrusion depth down until it closes that hole in, right about there. There we go. So I'm going to reselect current view and then go back and hit default camera here in the properties panel, and that's going to bring me back to that front angle view. So the ball shape is complete. Now we need to apply the seams and the laces of it, because in the actual trophy it's actually got it you know, kind of embossed in the shape of the ball. This is where it got really, really tricky. So what I ended up uh, doing, instead of creating another 3D object, I used a bump map. If you, from, again, familiar with 3D technology or 3D applications, you know what a bump map is. It gives you some texture. It allows you to raise or lower certain elements of your 3D object. So we're working on the extrusion material. Now, I'm not going to go through how I'm actually creating the, the bump map, but I am going to show you the file that I ultimately ended up creating here. Well, let me say, the, creating the bump map is really a lot of the key to how it looks. A absolutely. You, you spent a lot of work figuring out how to get this to look Tremendous right. amount of the time of, of creating this was spent here in this bump map file, sorting this out. And it's a lot of trial and error. So what I would do is actually have the file over here, do something, save, and then I would see it update on the object itself. Now what's going on here is that we've got, let me turn this layer off for the moment here. So we've got these dark lines at the top, bottom, and in the middle here. These are going to represent the seams of the ball. I'm going to turn on this element here. This is actually going to be the laces on the ball itself. Now it doesn't look like much, but what's going on here is that this bump map, Photoshop looks at it and it looks at the various black, white, and gray tones inside the bump map file. And then whatever bump map setting you have on, the white areas are going to come forward the most. The gray areas will kind of fall in the middle, and then darker areas kind of get pushed back. So that's why I have these three lines, top, bottom, and middle, dark, almost black, because those are the seams of the ball. They're going to push into the shape. The laces here, this is a lighter gray, and the laces just below, so they're going to be raised just a little bit. These uh, vertical laces are almost white, so they're going to be coming up the, the highest. So that's why I've got my varying. Uh, but again, this took a lot of sorting out to do. And I think people don't realize that that, mm. that tip alone right there is so valuable mm -hmm. that you really do have to start thinking uh, creatively in how you create that bump map and understanding that white is going to bump it out, mm -hmm. dark is going to send it back. And yep. you can, in a sense, shape the surface by how you apply those shades of so, black, white, and gray. Absolutely. So let's see how that's going to be applied. So I'm going to select this with the layer one extrusion material here in the 3D panel. Here I have the bump setting here in the properties panel. I'm going to take that setting and push it all the way to 100%. Then I'm going to go in this little folder icon next to it and choose load texture. In my little trophy kit file here, I've got that bump map file. I'll click open. And there you can see that bump map is now applied. And you can see it's extruding or kind of protruding that shape out. The laces of the ball are getting pushed back inside the shape, and then the other laces here in the front, the seams are getting pushed back, and the laces here in the front are actually getting pushed out. Now, if we were to go in there and edit that bump map, I can go over here in the layers panel and click on that bump map file. And, let's, and just so you can see um, a difference happen here, I'm actually going to turn off those two little laces under there inside this smart object here. So turn those off. And when I close this and save the changes, watch what happens. So those two lines went away, leaving just those, um, those horizontal laces in there. So I'm going to undo that. So you can see how that little bit of gray brings it forward, but not further than the laces themselves. Because remember, those laces were white, so they bring it forward a lot. 
So instead of it being called bump map, you could almost call it like topographic map. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. it, it determines that it determines the shape and the texture and the surface of your material Absolutely. based upon white, black, and gray. Mm -hmm. Bump could, you know, oftentimes we get caught up in, in what we call it. And so somebody goes, what the heck is a bump map? Think yeah. of it as making the topography. Yeah, exactly. So when I got to this, the point where I had the elements built and the bump maps were set, you know, now I needed to get that really kind of chrome finish to it. So that I'm going to achieve through the use of an image-based light. And that's located here in the environment section. I'm going to so locate or select environment. And over here in the properties panel, here we have the IBL. Now, if I go and choose edit texture here, the default image-based light is just simply this file with a bunch of white dots on it. Now, the reason we don't see it is because the reflection property isn't on. So let's turn that up there. There it is. So now you can see that image-based light in there. And if I select environment, I can actually use the 3D tools and move that light around. So you see it, you see it kind of ghosted in the background, but it just help, it's just helping you place it. But now it just looks like I got the ball shining on here. <laughs> but this is the wrong kind of file to make this look like this. So what I created was this image-based light here. Now, I thought about it. I'm like, when you see a, a, a photograph of a chrome metallic object or something like that, what do you see in the reflection? Well, typically you're going to see maybe the soft box or the diffusers that were used to light the element. You're going to see that in the reflection. So what I did was I actually found images of these diffusers. And then I made a duplicate and just uh, kind of experimented. This is another one of those things that took a while to sort out. Right. But what I ultimately ended up putting together was this file, because I took those same diffusers, flipped them and distorted them and twisted them, ran polar coordinates on them, and just kind of to get you know, random coverage on that. And right now, it just looks like an abstract element right there. But when I apply it to my object, so let's go and choose Replace Texture in that image-based light. There's my IBL. And click Open. Now I get this super cool shiny ball. And I can move that graphic element around. And if I go over here and choose current view and rotate it around, you can see it moves around in space. And now I've got my nice, shiny chrome ball as part of my Lombardi <laughs> trophy. And I just simply did this for the base element. I just took a shape, extruded it, and applied that same image-based light to that shape. And then I was able to move it around and then get that much more realistic metallic look on there. But again, that, this entire tutorial is start to finish on the NetMembers website. Uh, it's advanced with, advanced with 3D. So if you have uh, Photoshop CS6 extended, you can go in there and experiment it. I actually provided all the files for it. I call it the trophy kit. And it's uh, all these start files and the butt map I created and everything. So you can actually apply it and uh, play around with it and really get a good idea of how 3D functions here inside Photoshop. And that's probably one of the best ways to learn how to do it. I, I know for myself when I was learning how to put composites together, I would study other people's files and I'd actually ask certain people, hey, can I look at your Photoshop file to see how you did it? Mm -hmm. Because you learn what steps to take, what works, what doesn't. Yeah. The thing is, you have spent so much time, what people don't realize is he sits there and he spends a lot of time figuring out how these things work. Think about what he had to do to figure out how to wrap that all around. Yeah, I know, I, yeah, I know you, you, you look at that and you say, oh, well, he just applied this and that and the other, and it looks great. And it was, oh, that looks easy. Some, some people might be there. Right. It might seem easy to me now, but at the moment I was sorting this out, I swear it was a good three hours of me just trying this and trying that and getting it to sort out in there. But ultimately, it came together very nicely. And uh, But for those who want to take their Photoshop to the next level, it really does take that getting in there and playing with it. Mm -hmm. It's going to take going and getting that getting the resource files and playing with it and figuring it out until you know, hey, I can go create this myself in mm -hmm. another area. So definitely check that out. Our brains are full. We need to take a break. Corey just amazed us once again. Thank you so much. No, okay. Let's take a break. We'll come back. I've got a tutorial, and we've got another guest tutorial for you, so we'll be right back. Hi everybody, I'm Scott Kelby, President of the National Association of Photoshop Professionals. Of course, we just call it the NAPP, or just NAP for short, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about NAP and how for more than 15 years it's become the place where people go to get really good at Photoshop. 
Now, one of the key benefits of joining NAP is that you get Photoshop User Magazine. It's a print-based magazine packed cover to cover with step-by-step -step tutorials, real-world articles, and feature stories from literally the very best Photoshop trainers in the world today. As the editor, it's my job to make certain that we teach you the most important techniques and the most requested features, and that we do all of it in plain English, straight to the point, and we teach it in a way that makes it really stick. Each issue is pretty thick, so it's kind of like getting a Photoshop book mailed right to your door 10 times a year. As an app member, you also receive exclusive access to the NAP member training site. It's the largest and most complete Photoshop online training resource of its kind. You'll have access to thousands of online tutorials and complete start to finish Photoshop training classes from the best in the business. Also, brand new with your membership, now we have full length online training classes on Photoshop. So you can learn 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no matter where you are in the world, from the world's very best instructors. We also have three different tech support help desks on Photoshop and Lightroom and on Gear, where you get your questions answered directly by our experts, one-on-one, -on -one, right when you need it. Another big benefit of being a NAP member is that you'll save money on everything from software purchases to Macintosh and PC hardware, from plugins to printing and everything in between, even stuff like hotels and rental cars. It's the power that comes with being part of an association with more than 70,000 members around the world. And because of our large membership, we've been able to negotiate special deals and discounts and special offers exclusively for our members. And we hear from members all the time that say, you know what, I saved so much on my first deal it paid for my entire membership. NAP also produces the Photoshop World Conference and Expo. It's the world's largest Photoshop event where members from all around the world come together for three days of amazing classes and networking taught by the best trainers on the planet. Best of all, NAP membership is incredibly affordable. For just $99 a year, you can have all of this and more. This is where people come to get really good at Photoshop, and I'm inviting you to join me here at NAP right now and start learning today. Hi well, everyone, we are back and we have got a very special guest a little bit later. We've got a special tutorial from Serge. Serge Hamali. Is that, I is think that, that's is that, how you say it, Hamali. The, the Hamali. R is, he is a good friend of Scott over from, in Paris. Over in Paris, yes, of course. And so he's, you know, been with Scott on a lot of his photo walks. He's hooked yep. Scott up. And I actually talked to him myself briefly when he was here. Very nice guy. He's a great guy. Yeah, exactly. He's actually, he's into a lot of movie stuff right now. He actually was talking to me about movie poster stuff. So uh, we, we hit it off right away. So uh, really great guy. He's going to have something a little special from him a little bit later. But before that, Pete's got a little something for us today. What do you got? Oh, I do. Mm -hmm. Oh, OK. Boy, caught me off guard there. Yeah. Good thing I'm prepared. Uh, what I wanted to share with you today is the whole idea of using vector masks. Now, I'm going to start this off with the uh, idea that some of y'all out there really know vectors and what they are, but there are a lot of you out there that as soon as you mention the word vector, it makes you yawn like Corey does right there. Uh, you get confused about what vectors are, and so I wanted to give you a quick little briefer on what vectors versus pixels are, and then I want to show you why a vector mask may be the way you want to go for certain types of images. The first thing you need to know is a vector is really just saying, I'm going to put a point here, and I'm going to point a point here, and I want you to trace a line from that point to this point. And that's all you're telling the program is a point here, a point here, and create a line. Now you can also then add one more thing. You can say point here, point here, create a line, but I want you to put a curve into it. And that's all it's reading. Whenever you look at a vector image, it's just going from one point to the next and what kind of line is going there. And then you can add in, oh, and by the way, add a color inside of that path. The reason why people like vectors, we love vectors, is because if you take a line like this and you blow it up and stretch it out like this, that line still stays tack sharp. It doesn't lose any resolution because you're making it bigger or smaller. We say it's resolution independent. It also allows you to get much crisper, cleaner lines than if you were to freehand something. So you need to think sometimes Vector is going to be great for non-organic images, such as objects, projects, stuff like that, where you need a nice crisp line, whereas pixels are going to be based on organic images, people, animals, things that have a lot of, 
uh, randomness to it. That's kind of a quick little briefer for you, but the reason why I bring this up is because when you're creating mass for something, let's say if we look at my computer, I've got this image of this bottle that I want to cut out. Well, there are a lot of things I can do with it, but one of the things that I would uh, really help my cause out would be to create a vector mask on this rather than just a regular mask. And let me show you why. First thing you're going to need to do whenever you get a stock image, I got this from Photolia, is you would come over here and you would make some sort of selection. Actually, I'm going to go to Select and I'm going to do Color Range and I'm just going to choose the, the white. Sometimes it's easier to choose the background than actually the object to get a good selection. Now I see that there's a little shadow right down at the bottom that I don't notice but Photoshop does. So I'm going to hold my Shift button and my little selection tool gets a plus sign and I'm just going to try to hit that little section right there. I then hit OK. Now if I zoom in and look at this area in here, you'll see that it does a pretty good job, but it's not that great. Well, if this were a person or something else, I may just do a regular mask, but let me show you what I want to do here. Make my life easier. I'm going to come over to my Paths panel here. If you don't have it up, you just come over to Window and find Paths and click on it. And down here at the bottom, we have these different icons. And a lot of them are grayed out, but this fourth one, basically right in the middle, if I click on it, it says make a work path from this selection. Now a lot of y'all may not know that you can do that. Any selection you have, if you go over to your paths and hit that button, you can turn any selection into a work path. And you go, well, why would I want to do that? Well, here's the deal. Even if you're scared of, say, the pen tool, you don't even have to mess with it. You can just simply make a work path like this and then come over and you've got these two arrows here, Path Selection Tool, Direct Selection Tool. The Path Selection Tool, if you click on the path, it shows you the whole thing and you can move it around and, and place it wherever you want. It's just basically like the Move Tool for a path. I'm going to undo that. Then you have the Direct Selection Tool. And those are both shortcut, just hit A to do that. But what that does is if I come in here and click on it, in the path, let me zoom in a little more, Whoop, too much. It now lets me select individual parts on this path. And now I can edit by moving these around. And you get a lot more precision and a lot more forgiveness by using a path rather than having to freehand draw in here or try some other selection methods. Now I could come in here and fix all of these, but I'm not going to do that at this time. I'm just going to grab my pen tool but don't freak out, I'm just simply going to use it as a removal tool. One of the things you want to do is have as few little extra nodes or points because every time you add a point or a node, it gives it a chance to kind of be a little bumpy or choppy. So if you look at my pen tool, choppy, pointy, as I bring it over that node, it turns from a regular asterisk to a minus sign. And I just click on that and it removes those little points. And what I would basically do is I'd come in here and I'd remove just about all the points so that I get a nice clean line. And this is how you can clean up if a selection wasn't the cleanest when you first made it. Quickly, I'm able to do a quick adjustment like that, get rid of some of those, and now I can come in. Actually, that's extra funky. Let's get rid of that one. Extra funky. Oh. Don't worry if you get some extra big handles like this because what you can do is you can simply drag them around. Everything is changeable. Let's get it so I can find this, bring this back down, tame it, and just bring it over. Now we've got that one over here. I've got to grab it. Everything is fixable. You haven't gone too far if you've done anything with your vector tool. It'll always be editable to you over and over again. And that's why I love using these. Okay. I'm not going to take time to get this perfect. It would take me just a minute to do it, but this is what I wanted to show you. Now we have over here a work path. If we come along and we go back to our layers, right now it's just selected like this. If I hit create your regular layer mask, nothing happens. But if I hit it again, a second mask hops up there and that's your vector mask. As a matter of fact, to avoid confusion, I'm going to get rid of our regular layer mask. They go in order, layer mask, then vector mask. Let's get rid of the layer mask. I don't need it. But here's the thing. Look what happened. It cut out the bottle and left the background. I don't want that. I'm going to click into it. 
just on the layer mask, and I'm going to come in here. Oops, I need to go back to paths. I need to select that work path again. Now I'll go back to layers, select the path, and now all I have to do is come up here. There are three little icons up here. If I choose this one right here instead of exclude, I can do subtract. Nothing happens. Combine. Uh oh. You ever notice how sometimes you'll do a, there we go, let's try that again. What's supposed to happen, and you know, I'm sure people back watching right now are going, oh wait, you forgot something there. Let's try that again. Select, okay. I want to merge that. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, what is supposed to happen is when I hit this and switch that, it's supposed to switch, oh, I know what I did. That's the good news about this. I'm going to undo, undo. Now, what I want to do is go all the way back, even though I messed with all that. I should have done it as soon as I made the selection. There's a selection. Right now I have the selection on the outside. I need to go Command Shift I. Ah, I should have created the selection on the, the inside. Inverted the selection, yes. I did not invert it. So now I come back over here. I'm going to do it quickly. You can see how you can get this done fairly quickly. I'm going to add layer mask, layer mask. I did this all to show you what not to do. That's because I'm such a good teacher. Well, I give you the wrong way to do it, and then I show you the right way. Well played, I'm, sir. I'm gifted that way. Okay, we get rid of that. He's gifted, all right. Yeah, I'm gifted. Okay, so now we've got it set like this, but what if I just come in here, I make the path selection, make the path selection, get it, there we go, and I switch it to subtract. That's what should have happened before, is it'll flop it in and out. Mm -hmm. uh, you can simply just change your, your combination of how it's going to interact to get inside and outside. And the reason why I love this, even though it's a mask right here, it's a vector mask. So if I messed up on something, what if this was over here? I can cut out sections of it just by moving it around. If I've got too much white, I just bring it in, and it automatically on the fly changes it, and I get these nice crisp edges. So I use vector masks whenever I've got a product, something with sharp lines, something that I want to be very crisp, and I use that. But there's one last thing that you're going to want to do, is you're going to want to double tap into that mask, and the realization is that you can come in here and you can apply density to it. You can go from, it's basically like opacity for your vector mask. I go down to zero density and it's not hiding anything. 50%, it shows part of it through, all the way it cuts it out, and I have feather on a slider as well. That's something that's, that's pretty cool, that you can create a vector mask, and then you have even more adjustable control right there on the fly, and it's never affecting it in any way but putting a mask on there. As soon as I drag it out of the way, it's gone, and we're back to normal. So play around with the vector mask. Don't let it scare you. The idea of vector can be a little daunting at first, especially if you're a photographer messing mostly with pixels. Go in there and play with vector sum, it and is, it's going to be a very helpful tool. It is difficult to learn, but well worth it. I mean, I actually did a class on Kelby training on mastering the pen tool, so it, I mean, it, there's enough there to encompass a whole class. But it makes a good point because it really gives you clean, you know, flawless lines every time, and it's again resolution independent. You can transfer it to larger, smaller files. Not to mention, you can also add a layer mask on a layer that has a vector mask. You can have a vector mask and a layer mask on the same layer. Well, and that's why they have the two right there, so mm -hmm. then you can use both. And the thing that I want to show people is, some people are gifted using the pen and stuff like that, but you don't even necessarily have to use the pen tool much. You can just create a selection like you're used to and mm -hmm. then convert it into a work path, and it's done a lion's share of the work for you. Very nice. So anyway. All right, so let's, uh, let's go see, and let's jump over to Serge and see what he's got for us. So let's check out Serge, and I believe he's there with Scott Kelby. So yep. let's see what they got. Check it out. Hey, everybody. We are very, very lucky to have with us the number one Photoshop guy in all of France, Mr. Serge Ramelli. Serge, how you doing, buddy? Hey, how you doing? So if you guys say, you know, his name sounds familiar, and you're not living in France. <laughs> There's a couple of reasons why. Of course, we've talked about Serge so many times. So uh, when I went uh, earlier this year to, to Paris to tape a week with Jay Maisel. Yes. And also to uh, do my travel photography class, Serge was our location scout. So Matt and, and Serge became friends, and 
Matt went over to, to Paris and came back and said, man, I know the guy that has the iconic shot of every place in Paris, and he does. His, 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 we'll look at his, his work in just a few minutes, but today he's going to do a tip for us. But uh, I also went back recently to Paris on a vacation. Mm -hmm. I hung out with Serge and his wife. We had a blast. We went to amazing places. Absolutely. We had amazing food. Absolutely. It was just amazing. And what you're about to do is amazing. He's got a really cool trick for us in Lightroom 4. So set us up here. All right. Okay. Bonjour, mesdames et messieurs. So uh, this is not from Paris. This photo is from Venice, Italy. But, you know, it's also a very nice city. And um, I shot this on a tripod and I did bracketing. So, you know, I'm a Canon 5D, uh, 5D Mark II user, so I only had three exposure. Normal, underexposure, and overexposure. Right. Thing is, the boats were moving. And so when I tried to photomatic them or use any software, you know, it was just blurry. It was not a sharp. Yeah, ghosting. Yeah, ghosting effects. Moving. And it was really hard to get. Because even so the shots were fast, boats were moving. I was not, but the environment was moving. So here is the trick. Uh, I took the normal exposure, and that's the power of Lightroom 4, which I really love. Because I couldn't do that in Lightroom 3. That's something that, nah. that's something that really the way, the way that the raw file is being treated with Lightroom 4 is very different than Lightroom 3. And here's what I'm talking about. Let me show you in a few moves how you, how you have hidden information that you can get out. So I open up the shadows real fast. So now all the dark parts are you know, bright. Then I turn on the highlights. And then I, d I press the Option key. And I go for the whites on the right here until I see some white stuff coming up which is 100% you know, white pixels. That's fine. OK, so that's like you're setting your white point if you were in levels. Absolutely. Same kind of thing. Exactly, setting the white points. Same thing, pressing the Alt key and going left with the blacks. But I go a bit further on the blacks. That's my formula. I go, you know, I go until I see more blacks. I do as well, because I don't mind if there's a little clipping in the blacks. I Absolutely. think something should be black. <laughs> Not everything in your photo should be some level of gray. I think sometimes solid black is good. Absolutely. I'm with you. OK, great. And now the sky is still a bit burned, but here is the hidden information from the raw file. Because it's a bit underexposed, so I go in the graded, uh, graded filter. I underexpose a little bit. I make a little filter on the, on the top here. And uh, OK. Oops, ooh, that's too much. OK, that's about it. But then something else. This was shot in automatic white balance. And the problem with automatic white balance is often it's too cool for me. So when I shoot, whenever I shoot in sunset, I have a formula. That's my formula. I change the white balance to shadows, to shade, sorry, shade. Okay. That warms it up. Just that so. warms it up. And I just add a little bit of magenta. And I'm basically done. Now, I would do some, some noise, a bit more contrast and a bit of noise reduction. But it's really sharp. And I did a, a, a big print of that photo. And uh, it came out perfect. And well, it's a bit We're slow. We're the draw, yeah. yeah. It's a bit long, but because uh, it's, you know, it's a big file. It's 21 million pixels. And it's a, only a 4 gigabyte computer, so it's a bit slow. But anyway, so it works really well. And uh, yeah, there, there it is. Go. It's so really sharp. It, you know. If you have extra RAM, send them to Serge. Yes, please do. He needs only about four more. I think he'd be there. <laughs> but can we see your before and after? Can you hit sure. the uh, back, backslash key? I, I can't, because it's, a, it's an English keyboard. Oh, oh okay. uh, it's a French keyboard, and that doesn't work. But what I can do is I can reset it, because I, I have a virtual copy. That's the problem if you use a French Mac. You cannot use a backslash key. So that's the before, and that is the after. Uh, if it wants to come. There yeah. we go. OK. So that's the trick. And actually, since Lightroom 4 came out, 90% of my shots is only one raw file, usually the normal or underexposure file. And I'm good to go. I do this. It takes me a few seconds. And that was not possible in Lightroom 3. And you're right. It's because of the, the way Adobe redid the math, like yeah. on clarity, on fill light, on those things, it makes a tremendous difference. And you can get what would normally take you multiple exposures. Absolutely. You do it right there. Yeah, I'm a lazy guy, so I like. Uh, hey, dude, I'm the same way. I don't want, if I don't have to mess with three large pictures, and I can do it with one or five, depending on what camera you have. Now, so you're using a Canon Mark, uh, 5D Mark II? Yes. So you can say bracket three, but yeah. if you have like a Nikon D800 or something, we have to bracket five frames. I know. Right? And they're 36 megapixel images. You've yeah. got to take five images. It opens up in Photoshop as 600 megabytes 
to make one HDR. Yeah, I know. Or you can do surgery trick on just one image. Yeah. The point is, I don't like so much the photomatics look. I think there's a look to it. There is. It has and, its own look, and, for sure. I just like the natural look, and it, that's how it was. I was just trying in a few steps to just have the emotion of how it was. It was really like that when I shot it. Excellent. So you have a lot of tutorials online. You do a lot of training. Yes. Uh, where Podcast. can people learn more about you? Uh, on my website, photosearch.com. There are, you can buy my trainings. I have trained on Lightroom 4, Photoshop CS6, and I have a weekly podcast every Monday uh, where I do uh, tricks on Photoshop, photography, and Lightroom. And can they, are the links to that on Photosearch? Yeah, it's, all the links are on Photosearch. You have the podcast here, and the App Store is all my trainings. They are like $10, two hours course, great. very cheap, and I've got great reviews. All right, one last thing before I let him go. So while we're in France, like we're walking, and I did my photo walk in France, and, and I went on your photo walk. Yes. You came on my photo walk. We're walking through, and we go by this gift store, and here are these big, beautiful posters all for sale in there. And it's all Serge's stuff. He's got all these, like when you walk around, he, like we said, he's got these iconic images of France, so much so that they're sold in gift stores all over Paris. Yes. Well, thank you very much for being sure. here on the show. Thank Thanks, you. and back to you guys. Thank you. And suddenly, I'm Serge, and you're Scott. Yes. We pop them in, we pop them out. Hey, that was great tip. I don't have Man, my Bucks jacket though. <laughs> Sorry. So. I love seeing the before and after because you look at the, the beginning photo and see where he took it. Those are some beautiful tips that uh, Serge gave us. Now, we're going to have to jump into a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to have contest time, and so you're going to need to stick around for that. Be back. <laughs> So, you just saw the promo for Photoshop World. If you haven't been to Photoshop World, you must check it out. It is one of the funnest times we have a year, and we get to do it twice a year. Yep. So, uh, it's coming up in Orlando again, as we mentioned earlier, April 17th through the 19th. Be sure and check that out. And go to the website and check out who's going to be teaching here. We've got a few new instructors this time around, an Oscar winner. Or your your or buddy. Oscar nominee, rather. Your buddy, Aaron. He didn't quite, win, didn't quite win an Oscar, but he did, uh, was an Oscar nominee. Um, so, check that out. So, we have come to the point of the show, which is probably the reason most people watch the show is for when we give stuff away. So we've got a couple of things we're going to be giving away today. We have here the Perfect Portrait One from On One Software right here. You will actually get that. In addition to that, you will get this book from Katrina Eisman, the Photoshop Masking and Compositing. It's Katrina Eisman, Sean Duggan, and James Porto. This is a fabulous book. I actually have one of her earlier book, uh, Masking and Compositing books. Yep. So, and uh, it's a really good resource for learning uh, everything there is to, about uh, masking and compositing inside Photoshop. A lot of great well, and you're a pro there. at that, and a lot of what you picked up I actually early did, on picked was up that. a lot of tricks I use yep. still today from Katrina Eisman's books, and she is a phenomenal uh, Photoshop guru. So, you will get these two prizes if you go to kelbytv.com slash Photoshop user TV. Look for episode 334, which is this episode right now. Go in the comment section and tell us what you want to tell us. Tell us if you've 
ask a question, leave us a comment, something you want to see on the show, anything like that, and you will be, that's basically putting your name in the hat for the drawing for these fabulous prizes. Yep. So. Well, I believe that wraps it up for another week of Photoshop User TV. We do want to thank Serge for coming into town and uh, sharing some stuff with us, of course. And Pete, thank you. Yep. Enjoy. It's always nice when we're coming back from the break and Meredith, our wonderful producer, uh, says, wrap it up quick. So we're just going to cut it off here. We're not going to say any more, but thank you so much for coming thank and you. joining us. We really do appreciate you being here. Don't forget to join the NAP site. If you haven't been over there, become a NAP member. The discounts and the bonuses and the benefits are worth it. Come see us over there. We're on there almost every day. I oversee the NAP website. Mm -hmm. Come check it out. Come talk to me. Anyway, thank you so much for being here, and Bye. we will see you next time. We love Bye. you, Meredith. Yes, Meredith, that's for you.